Asalaamu Alaikum, welcome to Questions on British Muslim TV with me, Mohammed Shafiq, in the new time of 4.30 June in the blessed month of Ramadan. We broadcast you on Sky Channel 752 and across social media at British Muslim TV, wherever you are watching us around the world, a very warm welcome. We want to hear your thoughts and experiences on the stories we are featuring Tonight, you can call us on 01924231083 or we're on the WhatsApp number, which is on your screen now. Now, with the coronavirus cases hitting over 200,000 cases a day in India, there's growing pressure on the, there was growing pressure on the British government this week to put India on the red list. This comes as 70, <clears throat> excuse me, this comes as 77 cases of the Indian variant has been found in the UK. <coughs> excuse me. The joys of fasting. Uh, Public Health England's Professor Susan Hopkins had said at the weekend there's not enough data to classify the new Indian strain as a variant of concern and that the investigation continues. And in a worrying development, Professor Paul Hunter, who's a professor of medicine at the University of East Anglia, he said that the variant featured two escape mutations. And then the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was due to go on a trade visit to India on Monday the 26th of April. That's now been cancelled, and as you may have seen in the news, India has been added to the red list from Friday, 4 a.m. on Friday morning. Now, there has been a small amount of community transmission of the South African variant of the coronavirus in the UK, according to a latest report. Two-thirds of the cases of the variant have been linked to international travel and the rest of community transmission. Now, to identify these cases, there's been mass testing of areas in London, Birmingham, Manchester, where a confirmed case has been identified. Now, in the FA Cup semi-final at Wembley between Leicester City and Southampton, we saw 4,000 fans allowed to enter the stadium. They did not need to wear a mask, but had to show a negative test or evidence of their vaccination. The data from the test events will be taken in consideration of the government's plan to end all restrictions on June the 21st. Now, in other news, the Sikh community is in mourning after a gunman killed four Sikhs alongside four others in the United States in a mass shooting at the FedEx facility in Indianapolis in Indiana. The gunman was a former employee, according to the company. Police named the suspect as 19-year-old Brandon Hall, who last worked at the company in 2020. Sikh community leaders there say they feel traumatized by the attack, but police say there is no evidence yet. They were deliberately targeted or it was a hate crime. We send our condolences to them and their families. Now, shortly, we head to Bradford to talk to a man who's been at the heart of Bradford Muslim community for decades. From leading the Council of Mosque to welcoming royalty, Rafiq Segal has served the community for decades. We're here by his life of service and what he is currently working on. Rafiq joins us, joins us live shortly. Then we head to Rochdale to talk to humanist Guy Otten about the Buckley Grammar School, and he gives you an alternative view from what you might have heard on my programme in a few weeks ago. Um, and he defends the school teacher. OK, so the questions we were considering tonight, but before that, we want to hear from you tonight. Also, to, you can call us on 01924 231083. Or you can message us at British Muslim TV across social media. Send us a WhatsApp message. The number is on your screen. Now, the questions we're considering tonight. How is your Ramadan going? How should we acknowledge the sacrifice of our pioneers in the British Muslim community? And on that Batley Grammar School, is there a middle ground? That number again is 01924 231083. Your messages on WhatsApp, the number is on the screen as I keep telling you. So let's start with our first topic. Now, across the UK, there are some important voices who've helped build the strength of the British Muslim community. They've quietly served and have provided a voice of action, which has led to a vibrant community. In the Yorkshire town of Bradford, the, should say, Yorkshire is a city, uh, sorry, Yorkshire, in the Yorkshire city of Bradford, it's a city, sorry, the Muslim community represents over 25% of the population and there are many, many, many mosques. Rafiq Sagan helped set up and led the Council of Mosques, which brought communities together to deal with common issues. He served in community and charity projects and is currently a trustee at the Girlington Community Centre in Bradford, where you will recall we hosted our live West Yorkshire mayoral candidate debate a few weeks ago. Really pleased that he's joining us live from Bradford. Rafiq Segal, a very warm welcome to British Muslim TV. So honoured to have this conversation with you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Shafiq, for and thank you, Muslim TV, for hosting this event and for raising the community issues and community affairs, uh, which is really appreciated because people do want to see 
uh, the things that have been done and, and, and better themselves in life. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Now, Prince Philip died last week and today Her Majesty the Queen is celebrating a 95th birthday. What are your memories of Prince Philip, sir? Yeah, I think fantastic. Prince Philip has, has, has led a legacy, fantastic legacy throughout his life. Uh, he's been there. He's been sort of rock solid support for the Queen, which was very much needed. And I think he's played a brilliant role within the communities in the UK. Uh, and he got involved in the Princess Trust. Was fantastic idea that he set up many decades ago, which really benefited a lot of young people and a lot of youth which was fantastic. And he, his involvement was really, you know, something is, 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 you know, that we will always miss. I mean, he's, he played a fantastic role within uh, within the, the mm. monarchy and, and especially supporting the Queen, the families. So he, he, was, a, he was a great role, I would say. And it's, we, we sadly miss him. Yeah. And you've, uh, as I said at the top of the programme, you've met royalty. You met Prince William uh, and the Duchess of Cambridge, uh, Catherine. Uh, on their visit to Bradford uh, a couple of years ago. How was that experience for you? I, that was fantastic. Uh, really, we had a fantastic sort of royal visit in, in, in Bradford. And this it wasn't the first time. I've been very lucky that I, I, I met up with a number of royalties. That I've met the Queen. I've met uh, Kate and William. Uh, uh, and, and I've also met Princess Anne. Uh, and I met the Queen within her Royal uh, Diamond Jubilee twice that year, which was really fantastic. Uh, and and, and then the really, you know, the visit by Kate and William was fantastic. You know, they, they, I mean, they were really down to earth. The, 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 the things that they discussed and the community interest that they shows was was really fantastic. I mean, it was really a pleasure to, to welcome them in Bradford at Kidmar Centre, uh, one of the delivery arms for Council of the Moss. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting how they uh, they, they they really enjoyed uh, their visit to Bradford. Uh, lots of uh, comment by Prince William about how he enjoyed that mango lassi, if you remember That's correctly. That's fantastic. I think that diversity of Bradford and the diversity of, of, of a great city of Bradford, to be honest. I mean, people that have actually been to Bradford, see what it's all like, and we see all the, the really positive work that, that, that Bradford does. And it, it's really fantastic. It's just a matter of get, coming to the city rather than sometimes you get the middle of social media and then the media just just sat in London and, and just sort of commenting on, on issues and commenting on places like Bradford. I think it's a city that needs to be seen. It's a fantastic diversity, and there's a lot of fantastic good things that, that happen in Bradford. And, and, and we thank the Royals for actually, you know, for showing an interest in Bradford and, and, and coming and seeing us in Bradford, which was really brilliant. Yeah, really brilliant. Now, if you want to share your thoughts about Bradford or Rafiq Segal, you've got a question for him, you can call us now at 01924 That's the live number to the studio. We are live here on British Muslim TV Sky Channel 752 and across social media. Now, just tell us, it's been a very difficult time for all of us because of the pandemic. Uh, how has it been for you and your family? Yeah, it's been difficult. It's been difficult across the board, and I think all communities. But but I must say, the way that the communities gelled together, the way the community picked themselves up, the, all the communities, and including the Muslim community, was fantastic. In all honesty, the way that we show people sort of, you know, because we thought it would be a very difficult time but through the mosques and, and prayers and, and how people sort of came out for each other. But it was fantastic. The community really spirit was there. And that's diverse communities across the board. We saw people coming together, you know, and looking after each other. You know, I mean, one of the examples, Shafiq, was when we did the uh, Skolmo Cemetery cleanup. And the brilliant thing was that we actually cleaned up the whole of the cemetery and not just the Muslim areas. And it was really fantastic to see diverse people, young people from all backgrounds and all colours to be there and, and, and to, to, to clean the cemetery, which was really, you know, something that these examples are, you know, uh, are there, but, you know, they're, they're not publicised well enough. Yeah, that's really important and, and, and really sense if you go into Bradford and you go to that cemetery, uh, is it Schoolmore Road or Schoolmore Lane? Um, and it's absolutely full. It's, 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 it? it's just really sad how, how, much, how many deaths we've had in Bradford these past uh, years. My, my, my grandma, my, my, my mamu, 
my my mum's brother's buried there as well in the last 12 months it's just it's just breathtaking isn't it it is and one of the good things is in 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 Bradford and especially Skullmore I must say that the, the, the people people I mean are there on a regular basis and it's throughout 24/7 almost you know you mm. go past there at 12 midnight even and you'll see some people you know the people that work on night shifts and people that work uh, are you know working and, and they'll go and, and do their prayers and clean up which is really fantastic and that really shows that we you know it's a caring city and in the caring community across the board yeah and and how do you think bradford cope together as a community i think bradford has and i think bradford has matured a lot we've seen some we've been through difficult times and then and then and then and then and then you know like the riots and many other issues that we've had bradford is no less in actually you know we do have our own issues we do but we we must realize one thing whether you know we've got a big community young, young generation and that to be honest i mean you know in all honesty you know they have matured over the years we have had some sort of really difficult times when we've had the edl visiting bradford on many occasions but let me say one thing that the bradford community overall showed their maturity and showed that the, the, they want up uh, there you know for people to come and divide us we're, we're we're united we're together and we will not take and i know it did it did happen twice which was really very very distressing and very bad for bradford and, and that destroyed some of the image that bradford had but but i must say that people have built up on that and people are taking responsibility uh, but it does have its issues yeah. no, no doubt you know the jobs and everything uh the the investment which i'd like to see through the government through you know the the the, the, the you know the, some sort of investment by the maybe government offices you know uh, and and something to be based in bradford would really you know welcome that really yeah uh, we are going to take a quick break we're going to come back and then talk uh, to rafiq segal about his life and growing up and his contributions uh, we're really privileged that he's agreed to be with us for a full hour um, and what we'll do, we'll take that, but also we'll talk a bit about what's happening in the United States where George Floyd's uh, murder, tr um, um, the trial into the police officer that killed George Floyd uh, has concluded yesterday. We'll talk about that just after a break. We'll join us on the other side of these important messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. I hope your Ramadan uh, is full of blessings, uh, full of rahmah and full of charity. Um, we thank you very much for all your support uh, that you give British Muslim TV and we hope you're enjoying our output. Uh, we've got the one and only Rafiq Segal uh, from Bradford. And, and name in his own right, an institution in his own right. And he's been really grateful. Uh, he's been very gracious with his time. He's given us... Um, some really good time there, um, whole hour of, of him. So let's get stuck in. So let's talk about uh, your life now, and we'll talk about your community activity, but let's talk about where you were born and grew up. Just tell our viewers, where did the Rafiq yeah. Segal journey start? Shafiq, I was born in Pakistan, uh, and I came here as a youngster in 1968. That's 53 years ago. Uh, and Alhamdulillah went through schooling and uh, saw all the ups and downs in life within our elders and see how things were and how people were congregated in one house, the way they lived and the way they supported each other was an example, to be honest. And that's what motivated me as a, as a youngster to see how, how they supported each other and how they were there for each other. You know, if people didn't get jobs until they got jobs, they would have nothing to pay for the food and everything and and the rest would contribute. So these were fantastic examples. Uh, we also saw people that were educated actually helping fill forms in and, and, and being on a, you know, or sit, sitting there and helping people with, with forms and all the paperwork on, on the weekend, which was fantastic. And and that's the thing that that really motivated me, to be honest. You know, to, to sort of to do my bit whenever I could. Uh, and then after school in the 1980s, mm. that's what started. And and, yeah. and now I can tell you that uh, I'm blessed, and it's 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 no, you know, I'm blessed to be able to do that mm. and and have the energy and the and, and the passion to, you know, Allah's given me to to carry on the good work and and, and to help wherever I can. 
Yeah. So at that very small age, you came to the UK, like so many other people uh, from Pakistan, Azad Kashmir, um, India, Bangladesh. And it was a life changing experience. How was it for you? It was, to be honest, it was a different world. I mean, having to come from Pakistan, uh, you know, at the, at the age of around 10, wasn't easy for a 10-year-old child to come from a different environment and, and, and then just see something totally different when I was actually used to sitting on the floor or on a rug. Uh, and then you come here and go to school. Everything was so different and so sort of... But I think it's, you know, the one of the good things is when we people came from that part of the subcontinent. They supported each other, and that was the brilliance of, of humanity, and, and supporting each other's not here, but even back home, you know, the poor ones, the families, the relatives, which was really fantastic to see, and, and the bare people gelled together, you know, and to support. I mean, things are slightly different now. People have excelled in life. They've done so well for it, for themselves and for the communities, but, you know, in them days, it was, it was very, very hard for people, you know, the they used to work, put in 12 hours a night shift, you know, where they're working days and nights. And, and, and you were actually literally waiting for somebody to get up from that bed before you could actually sleep. If you were if you were if you were a night worker, you know, for, for the day person mm. to get up and then for you to get that opportunity yeah. to go to bed. And what was it about Bradford that attracted that early generation? I think Bradford was like, um, you know, it was very simple because Bradford was the place where, and especially Lum Lane at the time, because I remember my uncle uh, had a shop on, on Lum Lane, which a butcher's uh, when I came. And, and and in all honesty, you know, you could see it's like people felt like being at home because there was one a lot of people actually landed into Bradford before they actually dispersed and moved into other areas. Bradford was the center point of, of especially Pakistan and Bangladesh and India uh, and, and the West Indies and so on. You know, but but then eventually people started sort of moving away into other areas and and, and you know uh, and, and with jobs and businesses and all sorts. But Bradford was a center point. It still is, to be honest. Mm. I mean, Bradford is seen uh, and and there again when when we talk about Bradford there's a lot of positive work that's gone on over the years a lot of good things that's happened but on the other hand you know the way Bradford is portrayed at times i think that's that's not being fair to Bradford to be honest yeah and that early generation often faced lots of racism and xenophobia how was it for you it was very difficult. I mean, we had the skinheads at the time. We had the teddy boys, you know, that were very sort of uh, uh, against the, 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 the ethnic minorities and Asians. And no, it wasn't just Asians. It was across the board, the West Indies, wherever you were from. If you, if you were colored, you had some issues. We did have them issues, no doubt. I mean, I when I went to a Tong com comprehensive school in Tong, uh, there must have been around no more than 10 people there. And I was one of them. Uh, and, and you could see 10 Asians in a school full of 300 plus plus. You know, it, you did have your difficulties. You did have hard times. But on the other <coughs> hand, there were fair-minded, fair-thinking people and, and, and youngsters as well. So I must say, in, in overall, a lot of people are fairly generous. Uh, I mean, they are sort of understanding. You will have minority of people, wherever that may be, what, you know, who would mm. cause issues for, for, for both communities, on both sides, in fact, to be honest, sometimes, you know. But I think generally it was very, very tough in that days because yeah. we were in very small numbers and it was difficult and, 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 and there was no... And we weren't aware of the law, we weren't aware... So it was very much kept keeping yourself indoors and keeping yourself to yourself, that sort of thing. That's why, yeah. you know, you wouldn't see people breaking the law, wouldn't go down even daring to try anything because that would bring shame to the family and the honour and everything else. So yeah. things were very different in them days. Uh, yeah. And, and where did you get that taste of community activism? We've got about a couple of minutes before we go for our break, but yeah, just, just, just address that. that was due to the fact when I saw that the, if there was one person that was educated because there was, the literacy rate was very, very high within our communities. And I think when I saw that one single person trying to help almost 50, 60, 100 people on, on, a, on a weekend, which was really, really a, a role model for me. And I just felt if, if people, 
if because this person's educated and he he, he can he can fill forms and he, he's been to school and if he can give that service to the community and other members of his of, of the family and other on the members you know why can't we carry on doing that and i think that really motivated me the, you know the, the the elders trying to do whatever they could for others so so that, that helped me make my, my mind that okay you know i'll get a job i'll do whatever that, the first thing is to make money but on the other hand i will definitely do my play my role and give back to the communities that that that, that i represent so that's that's what my ethos is, and and, and I can say that, uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, it's gone through my family system. My wife, who's done many years of voluntary work as well, my my kids have done really well in school, and and then even after school, they've actually gone in and and and, and actually done a few years of voluntary work before they, they you know, they, before they, uh, you know, left colleges and universities and education. Yeah, that's so really... It's really that that sort of you know base that i got and i i i i made sure that i follow that up with 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 you know with my own family yeah well uh, well stay there i know you're staying with us uh we're going to take a quick break shortly but just before that break let me give you that breaking story uh coming from the united states that the federal uh, department of justice has um uh, uh, has announced an investigation okay let's we've got about 10 seconds before the break i'll give you that story just after the break uh, these important messages uh, for you, and then we'll continue our conversation with Rafiq Segal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We're taking your calls now on 01924231083. You can get in touch with us on our social media handles, which is British Muslim TV. The one and only Rafiq Segal is still with us. Just before we go uh, back to Rafiq Segal, I promise to keep, keep promising to give you this story. Now, a federal investigation has been launched by the Department of Justice in the United States into the policing practices of the city of Minneapolis. This is the city where George Floyd uh, was murdered. Do you remember uh, Derek Chauvin, I think is Chauvin, his name was, uh, was a police officer that put his knee on the neck of uh, George Floyd. And yesterday, late yesterday, um, he was found guilty. The police officer was found guilty of first degree murder. And, and obviously that's had some, a chain reaction of reactions. But that is the Justice Department. It says that it will be looking to see if there's been a pattern of unconstitutional and unlawful policing. That's according to the Attorney General uh, Merrick uh, Garland, who made that announcement. Um, the former officer was convicted of all charges yesterday. He's waiting a sentencing, which is going to happen in about eight weeks. But it's a significant moment in the fight against racism and bigotry, but also more importantly about holding the powerful to account and in terms of policing uh, the aftermath, if you like, of George Floyd's death um, and the call around the world uh, for racism to be eliminated and for black people not to be discriminated and harassed, bullied and killed in the way they are, not just in the United States, but around the world. Rafiq is still with us. Uh, we're going to take a quick break shortly, but just tell us, just tell us about uh, your reaction to uh, Derek Chauvin uh, being found guilty of George Floyd's murder. Yeah, I think it's 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 a good decision in the sense of you know, but nothing will bring back G George. I mean, nothing will bring him back though. I mean, that that that's the, that's the sad sad thing about it. I mean, although you know, it, it's sad to see the way that the, the policing has, and and it's not the first time. There's been a number of times where where you know people have innocently been killed. So I think really, you know, there's the the, the need to look at overall of the policing structures. Uh, uh, to to see how they can better that, to be honest. I mean, and, and look at ways of how how the police officers are trained, how they see things, because this this is this is you know sort of helpful to the communities and, and 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 to the people because I mean, obviously, when they don't have any faith and trust in the force, that's not a good thing in the sense of you know uh, for for any country. But I think really, you know, it it, it needs. Uh, a lot of th thought and there needs to be a lot of changes being made uh, after this. Yeah, and what lessons can we learn here in the UK from this particular trial? I think it's something that we can learn from, from it. I mean, it, 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 it gives us a signal that things mm. need to change. 
you know, the mentality, the thinking uh, of, of, of people need to change. We need to get away from all this. And I think this, this racism is, 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 is the biggest enemy of, of human race, uh, you know, wherever it may be. So really, you know, we, we need to learn from what's happened and see how things we can better that, even in the UK, to be honest. I mean, you know, there have been incidents, uh, but not, not maybe on the level of, of, of what, 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 what goes on in America with the gun, gun crime and, and, and with the killings and everything. But I, I still feel that we can learn from that and, and, and to, to, to put things into practice, learning from that country. Yeah, let's t uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, some important messages for you at home, so don't go anywhere. And then if you want to pick up the phone and share your experiences of growing up in the 60s and 70s, 01 924 John is on the other side of these important messages. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, wherever you are around the world. We hope your Ramadan is going well and you are not missing the food and water as much as some people might be doing at this time of the evening because around five o'clock, less than three hours, just over three hours to go. So you're nearly there. Keep it up. Allah bless you and Allah bless everybody around the world who's fasting. So just before the break, we were talking to Rafiq Segal. He's still with us. And Rafiq, Bhai, we were talking about your experiences of growing up coming to the country from Pakistan uh, in the 60s and 70s. What, what was it like for the early generation? Because, you know, those that came here in the 50s and the 60s, they didn't have any mosques. There were, they, in many cases, they didn't, they didn't know it, what month it was, if Ramadan had started or not. And they didn't have any mosques. There weren't many imams here. Um, and there was a very sheltered existence and their faith was was very much marginalized what what, what lessons do you think uh, would you learn from that time i think financially and, and and to be honest in them days they they came here to better themselves and, and and they were struggling with work and all they thought about was work work and work so, so that was on their mindset and, and to sort of try to better their lives and better the lives of their families and, and their relatives back home and, and here. So really, that was a struggle that they were up against, really hard and tough. Uh, but 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 things changed. And I think, you know, well, with the mosques and everything, with, with, with places of worship, they were struggling at the time. I mean, there were only a few council, you know, houses that were converted into, into mosques and people actually prayed in their own sort of houses. And, and, and then they went to start buying a number of properties, houses, where they could convert them into mosques. But, but things have changed over the years, you know, people are, but one of the good things about the, 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 these people were, and, and, and even the community now in general, is that they're, 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 they're very, very uh, good sort of uh, givers in, in, for the good, good causes and, and back to the communities. So really, you know, the, the, the donations that people make and the, the way that people, even during the month of Ramadan, you know, it, it, it's, un, it's fantastic and unbelievable the way the people that actually contribute mm. to the good causes. But in them days, it was very, very difficult. There were only certain people that got together and said, OK, you know, let's buy a house. So, so there were maybe 20, 30 people and, 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 and they, they, they actually used word of mouth to for, uh, to ask people and to ask people within the business to contribute something. And, and, and that's where it all started, buying a back-to-back -back house and then converting and then through terraces and then mm. small buildings. And, you know, the, so things just carried on from there. And, and it, it, it's it now, you know, you, you see the state of the art that the mosques and places of worship being built, uh, which, which is really, really good to see. Yeah. And then tell us about the early generation, uh, Rafiq. Uh, who stood out for you from those that came in the 50s and the 60s, looking back? I think there were a lot of people that, that you looked up to, to and, and, and certainly there was a lot of people that, that were really, you know, uh, that, that made their mark, with it, whether it's in politics, whether it's in religion, and, and there were certain people that actually set up the, I mean, I mean, uh, Sayyid Pir Maruf Hussain Shah Saab was one of the pioneers of the Islamic Jamiyat Tablighul Islam. Was one of the, the, the you know, pioneers at, at the time, working on a night shift and then teaching the children at the time. Yeah. You know, because he, he so, set so, up the first mosque, didn't he? Um, that's in right. In Birmingham, right. yeah. Uh, sorry, in Bradford. Yeah, yeah. 
sorry, the first mosque in Bradford was was Howard Street Mosque. That was the first mosque yeah. uh, in in Bradford, and the second one was 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 uh, Southfield Southfield uh, Lane, Southfield Where? Square. Southfield Square. Uh, yeah. That's where it comes. Yeah. So you know these were the mosques, but they also played a very significant role in the sense of getting communities together. You know, and and in the formation of council for mosques. You know, when you mentioned that I was yeah, the formation, I wasn't I wasn't part of I'm part of council for mosques, but not one You're of not the that five old. years. Pioneers are fantastic. I mean, they've done a brilliant job in creating this Council of Mosques, which mm. actually looked at the betterment of, of, of the mosques and supporting the role. And, 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 and what they did was there was two things, two elements. One was the me, uh, halal meat in schools, and the others was burials, uh, which, was, which has gone on for over 34, 35 years, yeah. which has been fantastic. Uh, and, and these elders played a fantastic role. And I'm not saying one school of thought, all the school of thought came together, which was the power base of Council for Mosque in Bradford. So we, we've got all the schools of uh, thoughts under one umbrella, which yeah. is a power in itself. And that's what's made it, yeah. you know, flourish uh, over the years. Just a quick question. You've been very good in terms of bringing those various firkas and groups together, but you've not been so good on bringing them together on the Moonish sighting issues. Yeah, sometimes in Bradford you have three or four different needs. Yeah, it's something that we've worked on over the many years and our elders have done a fantastic job and tried working on that. In all honesty, I mean, it's a difficult one because the sighting of the moon and, 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 and let me tell you, go back a few years when, we, when I was here as a young child, the place that they looked up to was, was the nearest Islamic state to England uh, and, and that was Morocco. Normally we followed Morocco and that was it. There were the main nine out of ten. The, the Eid was on one day, Ramadan was on the same day. So, so everything we, we worked together now. Now, with this social media and, and with, 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 with handheld mobile digits, you've got everything at the tip of your finger. So, really, it, it, it gets difficult now. You know, when, when you talk about the birth of the moon, whether it is visible in the naked eye. So, there's a lot of things that you look up to. And, 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 and again, there's certain elements within our uh, some schools of thought who would follow Saudi Arabia. Uh, no matter what, and and on the other side, there will some that will not. So really, you know, that that's the. I think the only solution that I can probably see is that if we followed the observatory in the country that we, we live in, maybe maybe the UK, you know, because we get their time to we get the time tables mm. for all the namaz time, prayer time, and everything from yeah. here. So. If we we could probably look at that side of things, but I'm not a scholar, so I'm not. I, you know, no, no, <laughs> with I, you, I, I, I would just. I, I don't know. I would just. It's just one of those things that you noticed uh, if you follow the moon wars uh, each twice a year that we have, and uh, you know myself, I'm quite active in terms of um, sharing information from all parts of the country about what's going on. Uh, but a sense of you, like in my hometown of Rochdale, all those filkas. They're all agreed to formula, and we all have Eid and uh, Ramadan on one day. And so there's potential there, isn't there? And, and, and hopefully uh, we could encourage people to have a UK-based um, setup up as I well. Think, I think, and I would agree that it's a very good idea, because the, the problem that we have is, is with the schools and work and everything. You know, when you've got people having an Eid on a different day or Ramadan starting on a different day, it is it is a problem for youngsters, yeah. especially that go to school and, and the colleges yeah. and, 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 and work and everything. But it, it would be really good. And I'd like, like to see that in my lifetime, if it can happen, where we all join hands and have. Uh, uh, but I think with Rochdale, with due respect, I think the Rochdale, because of, uh, as the community may be being in a smaller level, uh, but even no, then, just, I, I, mean, I, I, I don't think just just to get all the firkas together on one particular issue, one formula, which is you follow yeah. uh, you follow local sighting. If that's not possible, then we follow Morocco or South Africa, which is in the same time zone. But I just think we've had it for 20 years. Alhamdulillah, it works really, really well. Um, and I, I, I would love all of us to have a UK wide thing. But yeah, let's see what happens in the weeks to come. Uh, when Eid well, is closer. It will be lovely to see and it will be something that, that we all look forward to and Inshallah. I think especially since uh, nowadays who are questioners because they've got uh, they've got Mr. Google that they, they, they ask questions to uh, and unfortunately yeah. we'll only get what we put in to, to the Google. Yeah. You know, the information that, that, that's been okay. put in there. So, so um, we, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really want it to be. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure there will be an opportunity for us to have a discussion with the various representatives of the various methods of moon sighting, which is birth of the moon versus sighting of the moon. But yeah, maybe we can uh, set up a program on that. Just tell me, what was the reaction from the authorities? Because when the council mosque was set up, the, one of the first things that you de you you can the, the council mosque champion was halal meat in schools. Kids weren't getting yeah. halal meat. And how important was that? And what was the reaction from those schools? I think for Muslims, the two important things in life, if in life, it's, it's halal. It's, it's, it's what you eat. You are what you eat. That's, that's, and halal meat is the first sort of, uh, um, of any Muslim for halal meat. And, and also the, the, the burials. That, that, that's the other important aspect. And I think because we were together, and, and, and the credit also goes to Bradford Council, in all honesty, that ever since the Council of Mosques has been formed, Bradford, we are the very fine body of halal meat in all the schools mm. under Bradford Council, which really is very, very helpful. And, and the credit goes to Bradford Council. You know, we, we need to give credit where it's due. Halal meat was one of the areas and, and the burials, I mean, the, 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 the graveyard was taken over by the Muslim community as volunteers and it's been run in for ever since 1983. I mean, we've all been sort of halal meat and also, you know, the burials uh, and where the tenants, I mean, obviously the council is the landlord and, and where the tenants and we have almost, almost, we've had, uh, you know, uh, evening burials, we've had weekend burials, we've had burials right up to 1, 1 p.m. Mm. Uh, uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, yeah. Sorry, 1 1 a.m. 1 a.m. Uh, you know after midnight, one o'clock at night. Yeah. So really, you know, it's 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 fantastic, and the council has supported that, and we appreciate that. Yeah, I, and I've I got... think sorry, just on that, sorry. Just on that Shafiq, sure. I think the biggest thing for the, the council to go with us and support us was the fact that we were all united, and and let me say that our unity was the strength of Council for Moss with all the schools of thought under one umbrella. That was our strength. And that's why the, the, the council are listening to us and, 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 and we're working with the government. We're working across the board nationally. And, uh, you know, uh, so, so really that's, that's the power because of the fact that we, you know, united. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes before our next break, but just tell us um, that funding stream that you would get from the local authority and uh, other sources of funding, how accountable were or is the Council of Mosques to the wider community? Well, the Council for Mosques actually never went for any funding, in all honesty. I mean, what we did was, because the Council for Mosques was based on the on, on the basis that it was a supporting uh, delivery, it was a supporting uh, mechanism for the mosques, uh, and, and that's why it was formed. When we felt that, that we needed to do more community work and do other things, our elders decided that they would have a delivery arm called the Kidmat Centres. Mm. We have two Kidmat Centres who deliver arms with like learning disabilities, women's groups, ladies, girls. We have all sorts of different activities, events, elderly day centres, all sorts of things going. And that is the delivery arm, which is called Kidmat Centre. Uh, Council for Mosques actually never applied for any funding. Uh, mm. And and we, you, we 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 worked there as volunteers. I mean, our elders have done tremendously marvelous work. Like I keep saying, you know, they've done so good, well for our communities as, as volunteers. And we've just carried on. They passed passed the baton on, and we've just carried okay. on with the good work. You carried on the good work. We're just going to pause there. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about female representation. Uh, with a mosque and the council of mosque as well, which is an important topic uh, at the moment. Uh, we've got some important messages. John is on the other side of these. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. Uh, Rafiq Segal is still with us. Rafiq, let's just reflect um, about your family. Uh, mashallah, you've got a beautiful family. Tell us about your family. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, I've got uh, four boys and, uh, and a girl. Uh, Alhamdulillah, all married uh, in their own uh, households. And, uh, uh, my, uh, you know, my daughter's done remarkably well. She's a sister at uh, the Bradford Royal Infirmary Hospital. Okay. Alhamdulillah, she's done well. One of my young boys is is a barber working at uh, uh, 
Uh, Mario's in Bradford. Uh, he's been there. He's a professional barber, uh, floor manager. Uh, my other son works for uh, his twin. He's one of the twins, and he works for Yorkshire Building Society. He's the, he's a team leader there. Uh, my daughter, you know, my other uh, son works for uh, a courier firm. And, and that, you know, my, you know, the three of my children have gone through degrees and done really well. Okay. The other one where he thought that wasn't that sort of probably couldn't sort of keep up with the education and the pace it was at. So he was more of a practical person. He did really well within hairdressing. Mm -hmm. So really, and my wife sort of works with within uh, with all communities, with the women's groups. She's been friending and over the over the COVID, she's worked from home, but has done a lot of work within, you know, so, so, mm -hmm. so you know, it, and her list yeah. keeps you know getting bigger day by day because of the issues, the mental health issues within women and and and, and in general, to be honest. And COVID certainly has made us more aware. And and and, and so so we've been working from home. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, blessed to, to you know I've i you you do your best, and I think your family is is a basis of what you you know you Absolutely. you, you do. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and and a real sense, the reason I ask you that question is because you've got a beautiful family, mashallah. And whenever I've seen you over the years, and I've known you for, what, 15 years at least, and you've been, alhamdulillah, active before that as well. Um, I've always seen you active. Do you relax? Do you switch off? How do you relax? I think the difficulty is when you've got to a situation where you, 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 your passion, you know, your community work and, and, and the betterment of others becomes, you know, it's in your bloodstreams. It becomes very, and like, in all honesty, I've actually passed that on to my family, to my wife especially. I mean, I can tell you that she, I have definitely passed it on to her. So she's got that passion and that vision. And in all honesty, it's, 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 it's that pleasure that you get out of it. And you know, the internal satisfaction, Shafiq, and the support of the family is utmost. And it's the most important barrier of all. You know, what we tend not to do is communicate. And, you know, it, you know we need that communication gap breaking down, that wall that we have. We need to debate these things. And what I do is, in all honesty, I have the final say, but I've got to convince my family and convince my wife that you know the reason I'm saying why I'm saying that and, and the decision becomes a mutual decision if, you know you everybody's involved so they have a say and I might say okay you know your your idea is better than mine so it's that communication and that support from the family which is utmost if I hadn't had that in all honesty I probably wouldn't have been able to fulfill the role and the duties that I Allah's uh, Allah and I'm blessed to have had that opportunity yeah. and with the support of the family and friends. That's really... I've had fun friends over the years who've been really there for me. I mean, for instance, mm. somebody like yourself, I mean, since we've known each other, been fantastic relationship and I'd like to build that. You know, life is more than just yourself. Life is about other people around you, the communities that you represent, the people that you walk in with, the people that you, you mingle with. You know, these the the very important things in life. And you've got to leave a legacy for somebody to remember as a Sadkai Jariya, you know, when, when you're not there and say, you know, so-and-so. Like, I mean, I remember a blood called Glassy Shah, the Shah Sabsan. And they because he used to wear glasses, his name was Glassy Shah. <laughs> And I can remember the things that he used to do and people used to admire him. So these, you know, you need yeah. to leave a legacy behind. We as humans have got to do things for others. You know, let's yeah. concentrate a little bit of our time for the human race, for others around you. And, and what I do is it's not just the Muslim community. I tend to think wider than that, the humanity, the human yeah. race. Uh, uh, we're you know? going to finish off uh, uh, our time together. We've probably got about eight minutes left, but... I want to talk about the girl in the community centre and um, eight minutes exactly. Wow. Uh, I, I'm so good, aren't I? Um, so, uh, sorry, I just couldn't resist saying that. Sorry, my dear viewers. But um, before we talk about going to community centre, you work for a cancer charity. You've been in the community and I think your legacy will be one of strength. Just tell us about the Girlington Community Centre. Viewers would have seen it uh, and in our recent live broadcast from there. What goes on in the Girlington Community Centre? Yeah, we have a lot of projects. We do some fantastic work, and I can tell you, over the COVID period, we've had some fantastic, you know, employees who volunteered their time, their commitment, and actually gave, you know, food parcels to to the vulnerable. And we've done that 
all through the COVID. Uh, and, and I can tell you that between 60 to 70 people a day, that's the number of meals that we were giving out. And, and, and they were all volunteers uh, on the phone lines. Every, although the center was shut, uh, the telephone lines were constant. You know, you, you had people, you know, for advice. We were open for advice. We were open for any moral support. So, and I think it was more to do with mental uh, support that people needed. And, 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 and alhamdulillah, I can say that the employees were doing a fantastic job. I mean, and, 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 and our center manager, Rabina, very passionate. I've known her for many years. I mean, I was a volunteer mm -hmm. with her at Citizen Advice Bureau. And I can remember, you know, over, over my voluntary work, I mean, we came across many and she's got the passion and, and the commitment to fulfill for the community and and that's what I'd like to see uh, and and with my sort of uh, commitment over the years with many institutions and organizations I feel that it's a privilege you know Allah will give you an opportunity you know and he, he chooses his good people to oh, go yeah. there and then support and I think we should do, we should you know so sort of have that in our minds to help others for the betterment and, and Girlington has been at the forefront of, of, of everything to be honest I mean if mm. people once they come and see the work that we do you know in Girlington we're in the heart of Girlington we do fantastic work across yeah. the board and then during that pandemic or during the current pandemic last year which started last year um, you were providing food packs to vulnerable people tell us about that yeah, I think we had a lot of people that were supporting us. We had a lot of volunteers that volunteered to come on board. We had a fantastic team. Uh, some were actually employees of Girlington, but they weren't doing this time in their employment. They were actually going out of their way and were working week, seven days a week. So we were actually providing food even at weekends as well. So, you know, we had, we met great sort of, you know, friends over that period. We, we, we've come across people who were really desperate, homeless people. We've had refugees. And, you know, Bradford, it, it's a welcoming city. Bradford has always welcomed people with open arms. And I think with, with, with people without any source resource to public funds, uh, housing, everything we've done. And, and people have, you know, put their hands into their own pockets and have actually, and these volunteers have actually committed time and money and effort. And, and we've had fantastic response from the local community, the businesses as well, you know, so, so really it, it was an effort. So you, somebody's got to lead it, but you, you, you know, so, you know, once you lead it, people will come on board and, and, and join that sort of, uh, Good, 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 good work strategy. Yeah. And, and then within that, you're helping migrants, refugees, lots of Eastern European people who are uh, obviously needing advice and help uh, on benefits, immigration and other community uh, requirements. Tell us uh, how important is that work to you, yeah, I think the line was so busy because of COVID, they couldn't get to see anybody face to face. So the only thing they were relying on was advice over the phone and reassurance. And I think it was more of a reassurance and the advice, although, and, and the mental stress that people were going through. In all honesty, you know, the work that, 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 that these fantastic ladies were doing, talking to women, talking to men's group, yeah, you know, it's really been brilliant in the way that the, the people, and, and in all honesty, people People are, do appreciate, you know, I mean, even now people are sending thank you cards and they're, mm. they're appreciating and they're sending all these good comments. And it's not that we've done anybody a favor. It's something that was close to our, our hearts. And I think across the board, the, the mosques, the community centers, the gurdwaras, all the faith communities, yeah. the, the um, churches, the bishops, of, we, we've worked together on, on this uh, and, and we've supported each other. Uh, and I think it was all the faiths, all the faith okay. communities. I'm, I'm very conscious. Yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting you because I'm very conscious we've got less than three minutes left. And I've got two really important questions I wanted to ask you. The, the first one yeah. is, uh, what's the future plans for the Gunnington Community Centre? The future plans are that we're, we're, we're hoping to extend and we're hoping to, to, to branch out and, and more, do more outreach work in other areas. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, we, we're working with Greener, Greener uh, Girlington, we're working with well, well Bradford. Uh, so, so we're willing to work. And I think now is the time that we, we start working in consortiums. Uh, uh, I also uh, be running another project called Empower People uh, CIC, which is a, a community Community, uh, community interest uh, organization, which will actually help people skill and, and, and help them. 
so that get other community, other organisations together and work as a consortium. I thought you were, we just, you just froze there and then I thought you were disappearing before I got a chance to ask the final question. Um, and how can people get in touch with this uh, centre, very briefly? That is just based on Gullington Road. I mean, and you, you can find us in, in, in on, on our website on on on, on any, any, anywhere. Any, you know, there's a landline number, and then you've got an email address. If you just contact us, you know, you send us an email, we'll respond. Whether it's a phone call, leave a message, and we will respond, and we'll do whatever we can. We normally, I mean, we do concentrate in the Gullington area, but we are willing to work in any areas that we are needed to. Yeah. OK, uh, final question. We talked about legacy earlier on, about the pioneer generation in the 50s and 60s. But Rafiq Segal, let me ask you my final question, sir. How would you like to be remembered? I think what if people mention my name and, and, and show uh, uh, have a smile on their face and show that they, that they appreciate, I think that would be good enough in the sense of appreciating that, that, that you, you've done something right and, and, and they remember you with a smile, they remember you with a prayer, and that is enough for me. If you, they remember you with a prayer and said that, okay, you know, this person was around and he, he's done whatever he could, and that was that's good enough, inshallah. Well, Rafiq Sab, you've always been very humble, but I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, pay tribute to you and your leadership. Without your leadership and your commitment, Bradford wouldn't be what it is today. Yes, you can look at the negatives and the criticism, but look at the positives as you've done today. And that Bradford story wouldn't have been written in the way it has without your contribution and leadership. So we thank you. We thank you for sharing your life story with us. Um, I know you're going to carry on working stronger, fitter, inshallah. Uh, and we wish you and your family very well, sir. Can I... Thank you, Shafiq Bai, and the Muslim TV wholeheartedly from the bottom of my heart. The way Thank they, you so they, much. They, 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 that was uh, Rafiq Segal from Trusty of Gullington Community Centre. Just after a break, uh, we'll talk to Guy Otten about the Batley Grammar cartoon round. We'll join you on the other side of this. Asalaamu Alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV in the new time of 4.30, just for Ramadan. Don't get used to it. Uh, we'll be back to our normal time, inshallah, after Eid. Now, the important uh, voices that we've heard of the Batley Grammar School cartoon row here on British Muslim TV. Now, if you remember, the Batley Grammar School cartoon row was when a teacher showed an offensive Charlie Hebdo cartoon of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which led to protests and anger and sadness from parents. The school has since suspended three teachers and have seen a separate inquiry which will report in late May. Guy Otten is one of the UK's leading humanist voices. He's the chair of Greater Manchester Humanist and he's somebody who I often, even though I'm a man of faith and he's uh, a humanist, uh, I take inspiration uh, from his contribution because he's very respectful. Pleased to say that he's joining us live from the greatest town in the country, Rochdale. Guy, a very warm welcome to the show. Well, good to have you on. It's a pleasure to uh, see you again, Shafiq. Yeah, it's great to be on, uh, connected. First of all, what do you make of the national response and reaction to the death of Prince Philip? Uh, well, um, I've, I've got to admit that I'm not really a royalist. I object to the institution of monarchy uh, in principle. Um, but I understand that many people love uh, the monarchy and love Prince Philip. Uh, and of course, in Vanuatu, he's regarded as a god. So uh, that's all very interesting. Um, and uh, so if people want to mourn him, I, I understand that that's where, how they feel. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And then obviously, on the day that Her Majesty the Queen celebrates her 95th birthday, uh, obviously, yeah. there's going to be very subdued celebrations, but we offer uh, our best wishes uh, on her birthday. Now, tell me, uh, Guy, you were telling me just before the uh, before we came on air, you've had your second vaccine. How are you and your family coping during this pandemic? Uh, well, um, yes, not too badly. Um, none of us have actually contracted the disease. Um, and I have, I have four children of whom um, uh, one has actually, two have actually had their first vaccine, um, not that they're over 50, but they're under 50, but they have been uh, acting as volunteers at, uh, uh, you know, in various capacities, one with a food bank and one with a vaccination centre. 
and so they, they've got it that way. Um, I, we're a bit worried, though, about one of my sons who has some some you know health issues, um, and uh, my my former wife has also got health problems, so they're shielding carefully. But um, you know, it looks um, you know we I think we can feel a bit more confident about the future, the way things are going. Yeah, I think, and the fact that you've had the second vaccination, my mum had it a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, that's great news to see. Now, just set out for our viewers' sake, what are your initial thoughts about the cartoon now at the Buckley Grammar School, Guy? Yes. Uh, OK, well, there, there, there are a number of sort of principled points here. Uh, firstly, the, the, the right to protest uh, peacefully is, of course, the same right as the freedom of speech and the freedom to criticise and analyse and teach about blasphemy and about religions that's so important um, that the teacher was using. So you have, to, you have to understand that we live in a society where that freedom is important. And as a humanist, I'm passionately in favor of human rights, the human rights of each individual, uh, both to be free to use their freedom of expression and thought, to criticize and analyze and discuss other ideas, whether they're religious or philosophical or political, but also, um, I, I, you know, I, because I'm uh, a, a secularist, um, I'm passionately in favour of a society where all religions and philosophies have an equal playing field, if you like, uh, have no special rights one against the other, um, all have the same right um, to flourish. Mm. Uh, as as religions do, uh, to be free to ha to pursue their own uh, faith practices or their own belief systems, while at the same time respecting the overall requirements of everyone else's uh, freedoms, and that that means that as far as children are concerned, um, especially children in a grammar school, they need to be equipped to understand the range of of religions and philosophies and politics and cultures that they're going to um, encounter when they leave school yeah. or even before they leave school. And, they, and, and it's really important that they learn to understand them and not mistrust them or be suspicious about them and yeah. to be able to deal with the issues that, are, are, that arise. Okay. Blasphemy is one of them. Of course, blasphemy as the law was abolished over 10 years, I think it was 2008. Yeah. Only 10 years ago. Um, um, just, just let me say, so you, uh, I, I, is your argument that there is no limit to free speech? Um, you know, the, the sound isn't that good, um, Shafi. Could you say that again? Sorry, is your argument, Guy, that there is no limit to free speech? No, I'm, I don't think I'm arguing there's no limit to free speech. The limit comes when um, violence is provoked or uh, encouraged. And, 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 and death threats. So um, up to the point where the concerned parents and people from outside express their point of view peacefully, that's fine. That's freedom of speech. But when they start issuing threats, and we understand this teacher has gone into hiding because of threats, that's the end of free speech. Yeah, well, ale alleged threats, we've not seen any evidence that any of the protesters outside the school uh, threaten the teacher uh, in any way, or shape, or form. Uh, just for the record, uh, I, 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 I know of no such evidence. Yeah. But all I know is that the guy has gone into um, hiding, and he's not gone into hiding uh, just for fun. He's gone yeah. into hiding because he has do, fear do, of do, violence. Do, do you, and of course, that, that fear of violence is is very real, given what happened in France uh, only uh, four months ago. Yeah. And do you understand the hurt this cartoon caused? Do I understand what, sorry, this is ba a bad yeah. line, I don't know. Yeah, do you, do you understand the hurt? Yes, so yes, I do understand the hurt. I, I, I do understand the hurt, um, um, and, and I think it's, beho it's beholden on us in the general community to understand that uh, Muslims are hurt because they do love their prophet. On the other hand, we live in a secular society with these standards and these freedoms and this diversity, and so I think it's also beholden on 
Muslims, and I think most Muslims understand this, not to take offence unduly. And I, yeah. and I mean, I think there are there are some prominent Muslims who've made this point. People like Fayyaz Mughal, who uh, I think is a, one of the founders of. Um, yeah, uh, of who's, who's, a, uh, who's, a, who's a very my, a very small voice. The vast majority of British Muslims have been offended by this cartoon. Guy, do you understand it's because the far right have used these offensive cartoons by Charlie Hebdo and by people advocating for them, the teacher using this in a classroom, that we're helping elevate the voice of the far right? Yes, I, I, and I think this is very unfortunate. I think, uh, I think it's also correct to say that when the uh, demonstrators came onto the streets outside the Batley Grammar School, one of the reason, one of the things that happened was that the far right turned out in response. So there's there's a far right backlash um, that is encouraged uh, by these uh, these demonstrators. Just hold like somebody's at the door. So let me just shut the door. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, that's great. So, uh, and, and, and in a sense, the reason these cartoons were offensive was because uh, the, the, the far-right trope that all Muslims are terrorists and having a bomb in the turban of the Prophet Muhammad, that's deeply offensive. I don't know in what world that would be acceptable in a classroom. Yes, I, I, I think it's, it's really important that teachers are um, enabled to um, teach about these issues, especially to in, in, you know to to children of all not to children or all children, but particularly children from a um, an, uh, from the Muslim community. Um, I I was brought up as as a Catholic, and I uh, and I was cosseted and indoctrinated into one faith. And when I went to university, I came across Protestants, and it gave me a terrible shock. Not even Muslims, you know, and and I had to learn to actually understand these various uh, different religions yeah. and cultures. And uh, soon I had friends who were Parsis and Muslims and Jews and so forth mm. in university. That was fine. But you can. But, but, but I you think can... it's really important that that children are introduced to to this wide range of culture. But but you can, the point I'm trying to make, sir, is this: that you can do that. You can have that conversation on blasphemy or any other particular topic, not just targeting Muslims, but all pupils, without resorting to showing offensive racist cartoons? Yes, um, uh, that, that, is a, that is a technical question. Um, no, that's the reality. It, that's the reality. Can I just share my, uh, my daughter's experience? Uh, she goes to high school in Rochdale, and they had a conversation and a discussion, a respectful discussion on blasphemy. They didn't show any pictures or cartoons. And it was a really good conversation that she told me about. It can be done. It is being done in thousands of schools across the country. But this particular yeah, I, teacher, I, I, this particular teacher, decided say, to uh, use Shafiq. a far right offensive cartoon. I, I accept what you say. I think I think I think the lesson could possibly have been done that way. But um, I, I make this point. Sure. I, I was a teacher for a short time back in the 1970s before I saw the light and realized that this was not my <laughs> <laughs> my profession. Um, and uh, we were told all the time, you've got to produce visual aids. You've got to produce d you know, pictures and things to, for the kids to, sh to look at. And, and I think if you were teaching about anti-Semitism, you would probably want to show them a picture or, or related to anti-Semitism. And if you were talking about- But you about just showed the Holocaust, wouldn't you? You would want to show yeah. them a picture uh, around anti-racism. So I, I, I see it in that sort of sense. It's, mm. it's comparable to that situation. Yeah, but I, I think if you wanted to talk about racism, you wouldn't use the N-word or the P-word in a lesson. Uh, well, yeah. Would those, you? That's those what you're, words is that are, what you're advocating? I agree. Those words are now difficult to use. Although yeah. um, the crazy thing is uh, that there was, a, uh, there was a report recently where um, somebody had used the N-word and the report um, on that incident Use the N word as part of the report. It's appalling. And then somebody yeah. reported him. You know, it gets it gets to a point where it's ridiculous. Um, you know, that word existed. It's 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 a part of the history. It's not an acceptable word because it's yeah. offensive. 
but um, you know, you can still talk about the issues. It seems to me, and and yeah. this is where we're, I think without right. using... it is possible to teach about blasphemy without using yeah, yeah. the cartoon. But I think it's a, a pity. I think the cartoon is a useful uh, visual a... aid. What uh, a, a far right trope of a. Uh... Anyway, we're going to pause there, guys. Stay with us. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll start the conversation again with Kai Otten, uh, who is a UK's leading humanist. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. Kai Otten is still with us. Let's open the lines and take some of your calls now on 01924 Guy, um, Guy, how do you think the school should have addressed this issue? Well, um, I'm no longer a teacher, so I, I hate to enter into details of education. Um, but uh, one thing I am a bit worried about is that the, te the teacher has, has had to go into hiding and that the teaching, that the school has not been um, defended by the government or by teaching authorities. And I, because I think they were trying to do the right job. And I think the, the, um, the, yeah. the, the offence that has been given should now be, uh, we should get past it. They should apologise for that. Um, but I, th I still think that um, uh, most Muslims uh, should, and, and all Muslims, should not take offence when none is intended. He, he, he but, didn't, but, it, but it was he, offensive. He didn't show this. He didn't it show might, this. He, it was done he deliberately. He, to, it was done deliberately to offend. If you're using a far right cartoon, if you were just showing a cartoon, I don't know of a, a, a Muslim in a turban, that'd be a complete different context. But if you show the Prophet Muhammad with a bomb in his turban, that's deeply offensive, and you would expect there to be a reaction. No, I, I, and I've no, I've no information that it was done deliberately as an offence. I think it was done as part of a lesson to teach the issues around blasphemy and about and about different cultures and about terrorism, maybe. I don't know exactly the details of the lesson, um, yeah. but, uh, you know, I don't think that shows there was a deliberate attempt to... But, then we're, 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 but then we're getting into the, the stereotype, aren't we then, Guy? Because uh, you just link blasphemy and then terrorism um, and Muslims together quite casually, and that's what happens. Um, and that's why that cartoon was quite... Uh, the reason it was offensive... And the other thing that I, I don't understand, I don't know if you can help uh, me understand this better, is that Muslims have been part of the fabric of Bali community for decades. Yes, and I've, if, been, I've been listening that, to um, if that uh, teacher, your, your, your let, let me ask a question. Mr. Siegel, and he, it is, it's, it's a very impressive uh, record that he discusses. Yeah. But, uh, but, I, but let, what, let, you have, what you have to understand is, is that while uh, we understand that most Muslims and the vast majority are not terrorists and are law abiding citizens, and I've got to uh, take my hat off to some of the local mosques in Rochdale that have been going out there and feeding and helping asylum seekers and other needy people. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer with the Friends of Shamwari, so I know about this. At the same time, there is an issue about terrorism, um, and and that issue is an issue for Pakistanis and for Muslims to address within their community. And what we'd like to see, I think the mm. rest of us would like to see that, uh, you know, publicised yeah. more. So, guys, uh, so guy, let me not, ask you. Uh, and we don't want to see. Okay, Muslims let me ask you. Streets, uh, protesting about okay. what is a natural result that we're going to discuss it. Just before I bring a caller in, and if you want to join us, we don't want nine two four two three one zero. Stay with us, and obviously because we don't want to interrupt our guests. But let me let me put it this way to you, guy. Slower, please. Yeah. I'll slow down. We have a problem with far right extremism and terrorism in this country. We've seen terrorist attacks in which an MP has been killed, a mosque being attacked, and on a daily basis, Muslims are vilified and attacked. Now, how yeah, absurd yeah. is it that I... Let, let me ask you the question. How absurd is it that I hold you responsible, sir, for the actions of these far-right thugs? So, and you and your say, community say, need say, to take repeat action. Repeat the question, could you, uh, Shafiq? No, I didn't quite get that. I'm, I'm trying to say, you said that terrorism is an issue for Pakistanis and Muslims, but let me, let me switch that and talk about the far-right extremism. If I yeah, was to... If I was to hold you responsible, sir, yeah, yeah, for yeah, the yeah, far-right yeah, extremism and, and your community, how absurd does that sound? 
Yeah, that's that's a, a far right uh, terrorism is an uh, an activism is is an issue for a democratic society, and of course. But is that is that an issue for people the, like you? The, the, is that an issue for you? Is that an issue for you? Is that an issue for you? Is that is that an issue for you, sir? I Go would on. include Islamic terrorism. No, no, I'm asking as, you a question. As an example is, of is far that an right, example? Um, uh, extremism. No, no, but I'm talking about far right extremism from the likes of the EDL or Britain First or others. Are you responsible, sir, for Britain First? Are you responsible for the EDL? No, I'm no more responsible for e e EDL. So why would you hold Muslims uh, responsible I, for I, the uh, issues a, of terrorism? As a citizen, as a citizen, it's an issue for me to address. And I have addressed it um, on, on a number of occasions, yeah. and I will continue to address uh, extremism, whether it comes from the far right or from the far left or from the Islamic quarter or from any other, yeah. like the Irish uh, um, version. But whatever far right uh, violent extremism uh, is around is an issue for me to address. So and, I know I'm I just have done okay. and I will continue to do so. I, I just want to, we, we really, really love having you on. Uh, I just want to ask you this quite clearly, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more slowly because I know you've got some issues in uh, the line there. But let me ask you this again. You said terrorism is an issue for Pakistanis and Muslims to deal with. I'm yes, asking, I, I, let, let, I, let me ask I, you, I, let, I let me ask you the question. Let me ask you the question. Yeah, go I'm, on. Yeah. I, I'm saying now, how absurd is it that I say there's an issue with far right extremism in this country and they've had, they've been involved in terrorism in this country and around the world. And I hold you responsible, sir, for that. No, I hold I, you I'm, responsible uh, as a white man, as an English man, you, you, as a you, British you've man. You've already asked me that question. And, but you've not answered it. I've, I've answered it. You, you've yeah, not answered I, it. I stand So you've got against... a special rule for Muslims, but not, uh, but, but not for you and, and people of your ethnicity or your background. You see, I, I, I stand against all, all terrorism. No, no, we, we all stand against terrorism, but you, you specifically and, called out Muslims and, and you specifically and, and, called and, out Pakistanis. And, and what about yes, white I, people? I, I stand against... Um, uh, English nationalism, white nationalism, white racism, um, very strongly. That is something I'm very concerned about. Okay. And I'm involved in a number of organizations. One of them is called um, Ch Challenge Hate Forum, which is one that I'm particularly support. And it's based on Manchester Cathedral. It's yeah. in, an interbelief thing, it includes Christians, Muslims, Hindus, as well as humanists and others. Guy, that, you... that is that is uh, that is a, 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 an organisation that addresses right wing um, English white nationalism and racism. Yes, that is a concern for me. But would um, you hold, would you hold would you hold all white people responsible for that? Say that again. Sorry. Would you hold all white people responsible for that far right extremism? Yeah, yeah, I would hold I would hold white people responsible for that. Those who involve who are in it, and those, those who are that... not in it need to address it. And and that's why I say that uh, Muslims you. who are not extremists need to uh, address, as they are doing. Uh, you know, and and I and I acknowledge that, and I'm impressed with yeah. the the fact that they are doing it. Uh, they need to address that, and of course, we all need to address it. Um, um, Guy, you are one of my favorite humanists. Because Thank you, uh, you are honestly, I, I want to say this on air. Uh, I'm a man of faith and a pretty vocal man of faith uh, in this country. Uh, but you are somebody who is open to having conversations. How can we do more of that? How can we open conversations between humanists and atheists and people of faith? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, we we have speakers at, at our meetings and uh, maybe you would like to come and talk to us one one day. I'd love to. I wouldn't say no to uh, talking to you, Guy. Yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm very happy to come and, and uh, talk on your channel. or and to, I, I'd love to meet up uh, with some Rochdale um, uh, mosques and, and Muslims because, uh, um, you know, my, my connections are mainly with Manchester ones up to now and South Manchester. Yeah. I, you know, I've spoken in, for instance, the Victoria Park Mosque. They, they asked me to actually address them once, so uh, that was quite, a, a, quite an honour, mm. but it's also... Uh, um, you know, interesting experience, you know. Yeah. And how can we understand each other's view more? Because we live in a quite polarised world. We've had Brexit, 
and the sort of, you know, hate that comes out of that. Um, yeah. You know, you either remain or you uh, leave, and then, you know, a toxic national conversation I, I, that we I'm, have. I'm absolutely with you on this. I, I think over the last 15 years, there's been a rise of, of nationalism, and, and um, you know, and that's fed into Brexit. It's also fed into the right wing sort of backlash against Islam. Um, but I think um, Islam itself, uh, the, um, the 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 extremists rather they were um, a backlash against earlier abuses uh, by the imperialist powers and mm. colonialism and all that kind of stuff as well. What? So, thank you. you know, it, it feeds on itself. It goes back into history, and, and yeah. we need to stop it. And and the way to stop it is to talk to each other, just as as you're proposing and you, and you are doing, which well, is great. Guy, as I said, you're one of my favourite people uh, um, in uh, the humanist community, and I always uh, take comfort and, and strength from your conversation, even though we might disagree. I, I utterly respect your viewpoint. Uh, I respect you as an individual. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today, and hopefully look forward to welcoming you back uh, at a future date. Thank you very much, Shavik. Cheers. Uh, that was Guy Otten, who's a humanist uh, from Greater Manchester, from the town of Rochdale, uh, joining us on that conversation. And what we want to do uh, is continue those conversations here on uh, British Muslim TV. And in an essence, I want to finish just about reflecting about the brutal murder of George Floyd. Uh, last year, this time, you remember that nine-minute video of Derek Chauvin, the police officer, with his knee on the neck of George Floyd. And that caused protest, peaceful protest, around the world and a calling out uh, for justice uh, for black communities, for young black men to be able to feel safe in their cars and know that they'll be coming home in the evening without being shot at by police. And this one case is an historic moment. Derek Chauvin was found guilty last night uh, of first degree murder and all the charges he was facing. And this will not overnight change and eradicate racism and bigotry and division uh, in the United States or even the United Kingdom or anywhere in the world. This, I like to believe, uh, is the first step in building a more just world where we respect each other's viewpoints, uh, we respect each other's humanity, and we treat each other equally. That you're not treated differently because you happen to be black. Uh, we don't get into stereotypes and we don't see young black men losing their lives at the hand of police officers, the very institutions that should be there to protect people in society. So it's an historic verdict but it's also an important time to reflect about how we can change the conversation around racism not ignore it but take on the battle and remove the barriers that exist with the racism thank you so much to everybody behind the scenes for making this a great program to you at home i hope you find it useful to my guest and to everybody joining us we'll be back same time next week at 4 30 enjoy the rest of your week assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Wa barakatuh.